Welcome back to Bad Art with Sam, a badly drawn cavalcade of fairly dense material. Please remember that you can go back as many times as you want to get all the info into your head. Now that we've covered waves and some basic electrical theory, let's get into electronics. Today we're talking about components. If it's alright with you, and it is since you're from the future, I'm going to lean pretty heavily on the circuits we've built at camp over the last couple years. On those circuits we had to attach things to a block of wood. Those things are the components we're going to be talking about today. The symbols on top of the wood were a diagram of how the circuit was put together. We call these diagrams schematics because that's what they are. I'll be referring to the schematics of our Jewel Thieves and Sunlight Absence detectors when appropriate throughout this video. The first component we're going to talk about <clears throat> Sorry, bit of a cold. The first component we're going to talk about is the resistor. I have one here. It's kinda small, so let me get a couple larger ones. And in fact, here are some pictures of some other resistors. The symbol of the resistor is a series of angles in sort of a squiggle. Both the Sunlight Absence Detector and the Jewel Thief had them, and here they are. Since resistors resist the current, the strength of their resistance is measured in ohms. If I put a resistor in line with a green LED, the resultant light is dimmer than it would otherwise be. In fact, resistors are often necessary to protect LEDs from consuming too much current and burning out. How do most resistors work? Basically by converting current into heat. Here I have a bit of nichrome wire. Nichrome is an alloy of nickel and chrome, and is often used in space heaters and electric kilns. As you can see here, even a short length of wire has a few ohms of resistance. If you look closely here, the wire is converting so much current to heat that it's starting to give off a flesh-cookingly beautiful glow. Another device with many interesting properties is the capacitor. This component is two conducting surfaces, called electrodes, separated by a chunk of insulator called a dielectric. These components store electricity in an electrical field, and please remember capacitors and electric field. This ability is measured in farads, named after Michael Faraday, an English scientist in the 18th and 19th centuries who built the first electrical generator, among a bunch of other stuff. This component did not appear on our circuits, but I have a few of them here, and here's a picture of a few more. One notable thing about a capacitor is that if you hook it up to a multimeter set to resistance, the resistance will slowly increase. In order to measure resistance, the multimeter has to send out a small electrical current. This current will charge the capacitor, and as the capacitor fills with an electric charge, less electricity flows and resistance increases. In fact, once a capacitor is completely filled, it will no longer pass DC, or direct current. I can show this off by briefly hooking up our LED in series with a capacitor. Once I do this, the LED only briefly pulses. Didn't catch that? Let's see it again in slow-mo. Notice that after I do this trick, I short out the capacitor on itself. We'll talk about this more in a minute. AC power, or alternating current, will pass just fine. If you'll think about how AC is a wave consisting of positive and negative voltages, you'll see that the constant change in voltage does not allow the capacitor to fully charge. This ability to pass AC, but block DC, is often used in audio and power circuits to filter out unwanted noise. If we put a capacitor in parallel with an LED, the LED will remain alight briefly when power is removed and the capacitor discharges into the LED. Capacitors can store a charge for a long period of time after the power source is removed, and is why I had to short the capacitor to show the brief pulse of DC multiple times. In some larger devices, there is enough charge stored to cause damage, which is why it's not a good idea to work on some electronics unless you know what you're doing. Finally, capacitors have two distinct schematic symbols, which look pretty similar to the model I have displayed here. One for capacitors that will work in either direction, and another for if they have a specific polarity requirement. The next component is called an inductor, and it has a few symbols. Sometimes it's a bit of a curly Q, sometimes it's those sort of half-loop humps, and sometimes it has the block above it. An inductor is kind of a surprising component. It is just a coil of wire. Here are some of them. Sometimes the wire is wrapped around a bead or a donut of ferrite or some other material, which is when the symbol with the block above it is often used. Here is another inductor that's wrapped around a bolt, which I made myself just for this demonstration. What an inductor does is store electrical current in a magnetic field. And again, please remember inductor and magnetic field. This ability to store current in a magnetic field is called inductance and is measured in Henry's, named for Joseph Henry, a 19th century American scientist. For once. Inductors are strange stuff. They store electrical charge in a magnetic field, but they don't involve magnets. 
the magnetic field involved is created by the electrical charge itself. I can show this off with my homemade inductor here. By itself, the component doesn't do very much, but when I apply some power, electricity flows through the inductor, generating a magnetic field within the bolt it surrounds, and suddenly my device can pick up small metal objects. But if I turn off that field, the magnetic property disappears and the metal objects fall away. As you may have guessed early on, what I have created here is an electromagnet. Here, I'll do it again, but this time you can hear my recorded audio. No good, right? So, then. Oh, now it's a magnet. Because the electrical energy is going around, creating a magnetic field, inducing electrical property, magnetic properties in the iron. But if I get cut the electrical power, <laughs> all the screws fall away. Now you may not have played with an inductor at camp, but you had play with two of them. Two inductors that share the same substrate is called a transformer. If you built a jewel thief, that really tiny wire, together with the ferrite bead you wrapped it around, was a transformer. This device can move and modify electrical power using the magnetic power of inductors. I've probably built hundreds of them and know a bit of the math behind them, but they're still space wizard magic to me. And now a word about a special circuit you might be asked about. A circuit with an inductor and a capacitor is called a tuned circuit. A tuned circuit resonates on a specific frequency, allowing some signals to be passed and others to be rejected. If a variable capacitor is used, that circuit is tunable, which is pretty important to radio, as you might know if you've ever used a stereo with a tuner in it. Okay, for the next few components, we're moving into semiconductors. Semiconductors are components made out of a special kind of material that, well, semi-conducts. They're not particularly resistive, but they're also not that great at being conductors. Silicon is the bestest and most popularist semiconductor. But being the most popular semiconductor doesn't sound all that great, right? Well, for a long time it wasn't. But the thing is, if you dope the material, they become either more resistive or more conductive. To dope, in this case, means to add impurities. These doped materials are called n-type and p-type. n-type is apparently more conductive than p-type, but the relationship in semiconductors isn't that simple. An important semiconductor component you've used at camp is the transistor. Transistors are made of patterns of both n-type and p-type and have three layers. Transistors are basically electronically controlled switches, which is what we've been using them for in our circuits. Every transistor has three pins, and there are two major kinds of transistor. The type we've been using at camp are the bipolar junction transistors, or BJTs. If you'll remember me repeating this about a bajillion -ty times, the three pins in a BJT are the base, the collector, and the emitter. The other type of transistors are field effect transistors, or FETs. Their pins are the gate, the drain, and the source. Importantly, they can be used to control high current circuits with low current ones, and they can also convert a small signal into a much larger one, suitable for transmitting or causing yourself ear damage listening to war pigs. In a radio, they're called the power transistors. Another kind of semiconductor component we've been working with is the diode. <clears throat> Sorry, this cold is really getting to me. Another kind of semiconductor component we've been working with is the diode. Diodes are the one-way valve of electronic circuits, and here's one for us to work with. The symbol of the diode again shows its function, the arrow pointing in the direction current will flow, and the line showing the stop of current from the other direction. Believe it or not, we've used tons of them in our camp circuits, but for now, I won't show you where. Because they are one-way valves, diodes are polarized components. The positive side is called the anode, and the negative side is called the cathode. A diode will allow potential to flow from the anode to the cathode, the positive to the negative, but not the other way around. All right, so let's model how this one works. We'll take our trusty green LED and wire the diode in series with it. With the anode pointed toward the positive side and the cathode pointed toward the negative side, as you can tell by the stripe on the diode, power flows normally. Yay! But if the diode is flipped with the anode towards the negative side, the power does not flow. Boo. See the stripe for verification. All right, now for some fun facts about diodes 
I forgot to write down. Since diodes only allow power in one direction, an AC wave going through a diode results in pulsed DC, as you're only going to see one side of the wave as it passes. Hint, you've already seen this a couple times. Big diodes that pass tons of current are called rectifiers. And yes, that is a reference to electroboom. Look him up if you ain't. When current flows through a diode, a small voltage drop occurs between the anode and the cathode. This is called a forward voltage drop and is usually pretty small. The forward voltage depends on the type of diode and what it's made from. All right, you've had the boring diode. Now let's do the cool one. It's the one that emits light, also known as the light emitting diode or LED. And yes, for the record, you've been looking at diodes this whole time. The symbol for the LED is the same as the diode, save for a couple of tiny arrows pointing away from it, representing the light that it is emitting. And just to prove it, I'm going to wire a second red LED in series with our first green one. By the way, the material an LED is made from determines its color and the history of LEDs is worth looking up. With the red LED wired up from the power flowing from the anode to the cathode, both LEDs light up. Swap it around, and neither LEDs light even though the green one is still wired in correctly. So, if you wire two LEDs in parallel, one anode to cathode, and the other backwards, cathode to anode, you'll note that power is only allowed to move in one direction at a time, resulting in our low-rent police lights that we've been using to represent AC current. See? Diodes the whole time! There is a question on the test that LEDs are most often used as visual indicators. But that's technically incorrect. Obviously, the best kind of incorrect. Most LEDs are now used for lighting with the advent of white LEDs. The problem is that they want to distinguish an LED from a liquid crystal display, or LCD. LCDs and LEDs are completely different kinds of things that display information to you visually. So don't confuse an LCD with an LED or an LED with an LCD. See? Electronics is confusing at all. Next up, we're gonna talk about the pot. As you might have guessed, many of these components come in variable versions. The potentiometer is, and is sometimes called, the variable resistor. It is a resistor that can change its value based upon user input. I've got a simple one here, the kind often found inside electric guitars. The symbol for a potentiometer is a resistor with either an arrow pointing to it or an arrow through it to denote its adjustability. Potentiometers are often controlled by knobs, so think volume knob. If you've ever edited audio, the slider is another kind of pot found on the faders of an audio mixer. You'll see these at the broadcast radio station during the weekend. So if I hook up my pot to the green LED, which you know more about now, right? I can control the brightness of the LED much like the volume knob on a radio or television. This ain't on the test, but now that we know the diode, I can say that LEDs aren't really the thing to use in this case because of the LED's forward voltage. The usual LED has a forward voltage of something above 2 volts, and we're only using a 3.3 volt supply. That means we really only have a volt and a half or less of control, and there's a huge dead spot when we try to control the LED brightness by voltage, as we're doing here. But LEDs are what I had, so here we are. Enough about that. Switches. The symbol for the switch looks like a controllable break in the circuit, and that's exactly what it is. When the switch is off, the circuit is open and current is not flowing. When the switch is on, the circuit is closed and current is flowing. The urge to make Dune references in this video is killing me. Switches are described by pulls and throws. Each pull is an independent path for current to flow, meaning a switch with multiple poles can control that many circuits at the same time. A throw is the number of sources of current for a switch. A single throw switch controls a single source of current, basically on and off. A double throw allows for two different sources of current that could go to the same destination, like a three position switch. Here is a single pole, single throw switch. And before you ask, a push button is also a single pole, single throw switch. Common types of switches are DPST, or double throw single pole, or DPDT, double throw, double pole. The best way to remember this stuff is to play with it on your own, and if you're into tactile stuff, switches are top-notch. A relay is a special kind of switch that is operated by an electromagnet, allowing the switch to be controlled by a circuit. They're useful in that they generally allow a lot more current than a transistor. And since transistors are switches, and switching transistors make up the basis of all computers, does that mean there are computers based off of relays? <laughs> Yes, and they are awesome. Slow, but awesome. 
When we build circuits, we want to prevent them from exploding. One way we prevent them from exploding is by using such small currents that they can't possibly damage the equipment or any wayward campers who happen to be lying around. But we can't always do that. One major way of protecting a circuit is with a fuse. A fuse is a small, protected bit of metal that melts when the current flow goes above a specified amperage. I tried to demo one for this video and nearly set my desk on fire, so none of that. Fuses are pretty common on radios. When a fuse melts, we say that it has blown. When this happens, replace the fuse with one of the same rating. If you replace the fuse with a larger rating, even temporarily, you risk damaging the equipment, harming yourself and your turtle, or starting a fire. All right, now we gotta get some high level stuff done here. An integrated chip, also called an IC, is a bunch of semiconductor components hooked together in a single package. The main CPU of a computer is possibly the most famous example of this. A CPU converts electricity into heat and a small amount of video games. Remember the word oscillator? That's coming home to roost here. An oscillator produces a steady signal at one frequency, and by signal, we mean wave. Oscillators are used in both transmitters and receivers. When a signal is changed in order to convey information, we refer to that as modulation. Thus in radio, a circuit that changes an RF wave to convey information is called a modulator. And finally, mixers combine two free... <clears throat> this sentence is possibly the worst sentence I have ever written. <laughs> and finally, mixers modify two RF frequencies to convert one of them to a third frequency. This is pretty key to a lot of radio technology. And yeah, this is all on the test. Finally, here are a lot of schematic symbols that we didn't cover in this video. Heck, we didn't even talk about the lines, which correspond to electrical connections, but don't always mean wires. Honestly, a 20 minute video isn't the best way to learn these. Your book is worth taking a look at, and there's a lot of material online if you're wanting to learn more. The quiz might ask you to identify the components in a schematic circuit diagram. We've covered most of the ones they're going to ask about in this video, but there's one or two that you're expected to ID without knowing much about them. Check the book. And that's all the time we've got for this video. Sorry it's late. Christmas in Chicago with your family is a bit of a deal when there's a bunch of potential new campers lying around. Remember to give the test quiz a shot when you've got some time at imnotsquitting.com slash exam. And remember to have a merry capacitor store in an electrical field and a happy inductor store in a magnetic field. Also remember, fear is the mind killer. That's a Dune reference, but if you're worried about the test, remember the litany against fear. The Bene Gesserit teach it for a reason.